please take a seat. Good afternoon and welcome to you all. It is wonderful to have you all here together to honour the visit of Dr Ngozi Okujongo Ikovela. I'm not sure I said that right. But I'm sure they'll... Was it close enough? It was close enough. Thank you. Someone who needs no introduction, but the formalities will follow. Of course, I'm referring to the Director General of the World Trade Organization, here with us in Melbourne after her recent attendance at the G20 summit just last week in Bali. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Professor Caron Beaton Wells, and I'm the Dean Internal here at the Business School in Melbourne. Now, in a moment, um, I'm just going to outline today's proceedings, but before I go any further, let me acknowledge on behalf of all present and at the Melbourne Business School that we're gathering here today on the lands of the Rwandri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land, and we celebrate their connection to this country and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also do just personally acknowledge and welcome any First Nations people with us in the room today. Now, as for the format of today's event, you have before you your entree to enjoy. And after that, I'm going to formally introduce the Director General and invite her and our Dean Professor Ian Harper to the stage for what I know uh, is, a, is a much anticipated discussion about global trade, sustainability, gender equity, food security and essential medicines. And once that's concluded, Ian and Dr Ngozi will return to the table for main course. And after that, they will return to answer questions from our audience. So as they arise, please take a note of them. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you as well. Needless to say, we are very grateful to have the benefit of this visit, um, given the very busy schedule of Dr Ngozi, working around her many other engagements, including with our Prime Minister. So with that in mind, we will try and keep questions to a maximum of 25 minutes. And then um, shortly before 1.30, I'll return and just ask you to remain seated while the formal party makes their way out. But we will conclude only at two o'clock, so if there is time, do please stay with us to enjoy each other's company. But that's all for me from now, for now, so please do just enjoy your entree, and we'll be back for some formalities soon. Just a short in advance before we do need to move on, and of course, I know you are all keen to get to the main event, so it's now my very great to introduce to you one of the world's most recognised and distinguished leaders, Dr. Nicole Theo from the first and the first African leader of the World Trade Organisation, where she's been Director General since March last year. I don't need to impress on this audience, I'm sure, the significance of the WTO in the international arena, and maybe now more than ever so. It's been said many times before that if goods and services are crossing borders, then tanks and soldiers less likely to do so. But of course, you also know that in recent times it's just been getting harder for that kind of mobility global pandemic, shifting geopolitical attitudes, and outbreak of conflict in Europe, all taking their toll on trade relations. And enter Dr. Mugot, global finance expert, economist and international development professional with more than 25 years, working or more than 30 years, working across the globe on these issues. Before taking up her role as DG, Dr Ngozi was Chair of the Board of Gavi Vaccine Alliance and has also served on the boards of Standard Chartered Bank and Twitter. She's twice served as Nigeria's Finance Manager, uh, Minister and briefly acted as Foreign Minister. Spent 25 years at the World Bank 
and is, of course, I'm sure you will hear soon, an ardent, inherent power trait to lift the developing world up. So suffice to say, the WTO is in extremely capable hands, and for a major trade nation like Australia, that is music to our ears. Dr Ngozi has just uh, managed to organise the first meeting of trade ministers from some 164 member nations resulting in pioneering agreements across a range of areas. We are just deeply honoured to have her with us today, having attended not just the G20, but prior to that COP27 in Egypt. So please do warmly welcome with me Dr Ngozi and Professor Harvard. Dr. Verdi, it is indeed a, a wonderful honor for us to have you here in Melbourne. Uh, in Australia, I understand your first time. Certainly, good one. Thank you very much for joining us. As Karam uh, just indicated, you were um, in June this year, uh, you convened the first ministerial meeting in four years, the first one, of course, under your direction. This meeting was widely viewed as a success, and I'm paraphrasing what you said after the meeting. The resulting package contains unprecedented outcomes, showing the world that the WTO can address problems of the global economies. You also have just attended the G20, a government meeting in Bali where the WTO received numerous mentions in the final communique. So, Dr. Ngozi, could you can we begin by my asking you to explain to us why you're so positive about the WTO's role in addressing problems of the global commons, as you put Well, thank you very much, Mr. Halpern. Thank you all for having me uh, and for spending part of your afternoon. It's wonderful to be in Melbourne. This is my third visit to Australia, but the first in this city beautiful city, and uh, it's the city of George Mina, he's a graduate of this university, Ambassador Mina, so I think today is a really special day for you also. <laughs> uh, but um, it's good to be here, you know, ask me why am I so positive about the WTO? I think if I wasn't positive, I wouldn't have taken the job. That's the bottom line. And Sometimes people say I'm a masochist. I'm always going into situations that are very and challenging. But um, as I said to an earlier audience today, what, uh, when my president asked me to enter the context to be director general of the WTO, um, when I was having fun as chair of the board of government, uh, I went to, of course, I've known the WTO from my career at the World Bank 20, 25 years. But, Really looking closely, when I looked at the purpose of the organization, because that's what drives me in whatever I do. What is the purpose? What can one achieve with whatever position one is in? And the purpose said it's for enhancing living standards, for creating employment, and for supporting sustainable development. And I thought there's no more interesting purpose than this, because it's all about people. And so that made me really positive about the WTO. And um, when I took the job and saw that there are quite a few challenges, but also several opportunities, um, and that we could really break through uh, and, and try to make the organization deliver more for its members, both developed and developing. Um, so we set out to do that, to do that, we have to break through what I call the culture of failure. Uh, and that's uh, past ambassador Dina to forgive me, but I got there asking, why should it take 20 years plus to, to come, come to a, an agreement on curbing harmful fishery subsidies of $22 mm. billion dollars a year that are leading to overfishing, illegal and unreported fishing on, and lack of sustainability of our oceans. Mm. Why should it take more than 20 years to deliver an agreement in agricultural trade or during the pandemic to come to a conclusion on vaccines? 
in a few months. And it was to break through that in an organization where trust among members was very limited. Mm. Trying to create a culture of su success. And that's what we did with the ministerial mm. meetings, yeah. meetings mm. to try mm. and break through this, get some successes, restore trust among members. It's not that we've done it completely yet, but when mm. you succeed together, it helps to set the stage for more. Mm. Yeah, sounds so. like it's been a great start, widely acknowledged. Now you just come from Sharm el Sheikh and COP27 as well, and you mentioned, as I said earlier on, the WT's role in addressing the problems of the global commons doesn't really get much bigger than climate change when it comes to problems of the global commons. So can you give us a sense of how you see uh, the WTO and the role it plays in trade liberalisation addressing carbon emissions and climate change? Yeah. Um, another very important qu question uh, or problem when you think about these problems, the poly crisis that we're experiencing in the world today, much of which, which are problems of the global commons, the pandemic no one country can solve on its own, climate mm. change. Uh, then I asked myself the question, how can trade be part of the solution? What are the opportunities that trade, the multilateral trading system and WTO could seize to be part of net zero by 2050? People are used to viewing trade and the trading system as part of the problem because of mm. the logistics of trade, you know, the carbon emissions that uh, result from this, or even trade itself, you know, when you, uh, certain products that lead to higher carbon emissions or deplete carbon sinks and so on. Mm. Uh, so turning that psychology around to say, how can we be part of the solution? When we started looking at it at the WTO, we really found that the one missing ingredient in getting to net zero is the lack of focus on trade and trade policy. And this is the message I took to Shamel Sheikh, saying you, there's a big piece missing here that mm. is not in your nationally determined contributions. And when you're revising these, you've got to get trade and trade policy. Why is that? Trade, if you want to mitigate, you cannot do that without trade. How do you get the technologies you need from one where they are founded and made and so on to other parts? Mm. Can only do it to, through trade. <coughs> trade is an adaptation tool. How do you adapt after an event when you don't have the goods and services with you? You have to get them through trade. So changing people's views to think of trade in this way has been critically important. And of course, we did do the first trade and climate change report uh, if you can hold it up, uh, uh, you know, mm. we, we didn't bring nice, elegant <coughs> copies, but we just printed this off so you could see. So we went to launch that at Sham El Sheikh to show. Now, you know, one of the things we can do is if we can have an agreement on environmental goods and services, that could also be very beneficial. There was one that was started, shelved in 2016 because of disagreement among countries on certain goods mm. uh, being described as environmentally friendly and who would it benefit. But we can revive that and that's one of the objectives we have with a limited list of goods and services. And that would be a net benefit also mm. uh, to net zero. Carbon pricing. I don't think we can really solve the problem of lowering carbon emissions without price. Of course, I would say that I'm an economist, wouldn't I? But I really think unless we get a carbon pricing framework, a global framework in place, this will be one of the critical tools. I'm not saying it's the mm -hmm. only tool, but it's an important tool to lowering carbon emissions. What you price, then you can gauge where you are. You know, once you put a price on something, it makes a a big difference. So at the WTO, we're working on a global carbon pricing framework that takes into account some normative criteria that will be very important to our members. If you are a low income, low polluting country, you should face a different and lower carbon price from a high income, high polluter. Common but differentiated responsibilities should factor into how we look at carbon pricing and floor, floor prices across mm. the spectrum. We're working on that framework as part of what I think should be a comp contribution to net zero by 2050. Mm. I could go on and on, but just to give you mm. a flavor 
of some of the things we have in this report, pointing to how trade and, and, and the global trading system and the WTO rules can be part of the fight uh, of mm. net zero. Mm. No, that's terrific. I don't think you'd need to convince this audience of the importance of trade uh, for that objective or lots of others, mm. frankly. But as you well know, Dr. Ngozi, as a result of the pandemic, trade, in a sense, has gotten a bit of a bad name and people are seeking once more to shore up self-sufficiency, are concerned about exposure of supply lines uh, that have been uh, broken through the pandemic. How does the WTO answer that question when people say, well, traders, it's all well and good, uh, but we are now exposed to broken supply lines. We have to do these things ourselves. And there's a reversal, it would appear, in some people's minds, of the importance of comparative advantage in trade, right at its very core. Well, you know, one of the things that is most interesting to me is that before nobody paid attention to supply chains mm. or knew what it Now it's the most sexy to topic. <laughs> Uh, and everyone knows something about supply chains. But look, the <coughs> pandemic and uh, the war in Ukraine have exposed certain vulnerabilities in our supply chains. They've also shown us the concentration of manufacturing of certain critical products. Most people did, did not know that 80% of vaccine exports come from 10 countries in the world. Um, that's concentration. We've seen the semiconductor business now, how the concentration of that in Taiwan, 90, 95% of production of semiconductors in one country exposes you. We saw what happened when there was flooding in Thailand mm. to the automotive industry and how that concentration also mattered. So we've seen these vulnerabilities. And that is making some people think that, well, maybe the best thing is given the geopolitical tensions we're living, to reshore, mm. to, on, to um, on, uh, French shore, or some people, as Jeffrey Wilson here in Australia said in an article, tr to do trusted trade. So it has different sorts of names. And of course, there is some sense to that. I think business, and I'm sure there are some business people in the room, you know, looks at it and sees that it has to manage risks. Mm. And uh, actually diversification of some of these supply chains that started away from China because of rising labor costs to other places like Vietnam and so on. I think what we've seen is the vulnerabilities has speeded that up. But the fact that we may see some reshoring and some quote unquote French shoring as Janet Yellen calls it, uh, does not mean that, uh, you know, reshoring everything or even French shoring everything is the answer. Mm. Especially when you have climate risks. You reshore your supply chains. What if you have an event that really severely impacts on that? Then what happens? We saw in the U.S. baby formula uh, supply chain all concentrated in the U.S. And when there was an event... The U.S. had to fly uh, President Biden, had to send planes to go and get baby formula from somewhere else. Mm. So we should be careful that reshoring everything is not the answer. French shoring, yes, maybe there's some element of that or trusted trade. But be careful. Who is a friend? Mm. How do you define friends? Mm. Who is trusted? So Vietnam is trusted today. I'm just speaking Vietnam, not because yeah. there's anything. <laughs> but it could That's become not, not trusted tomorrow mm. if something changes. The EU is a trusted friend. But depending on what happens, they may not be so trusted. So mm. what do we mean when we say trusted trade and French shoring? So some of that will occur. I, I totally take the point that mm. semiconductor must be diversified. But let's be careful. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. What we're saying is that we have to manage risks. And I think the way business is making the decision makes sense. What we should do is seek to diversify these supply chains globally in what I call re-globalization. <coughs> Let's use this as an opportunity to bring in those countries that have been left out of the success of trade, mm -hmm. 
those people who have been marginalized, let's create jobs for them, let's locate this, the, the manufacturing and the supply chains in some of these emerging markets and developing countries that have the right environment. And not just think of those who are close to us or who are near us as being the less risky, uh, you know, and those who, whom we think are friends today but may not, may not be friends tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So let's re-globalize. Let's not only friend show and trust show. Mm. Let me change uh, gear, uh, Dr. Ngozi. There'd be a, a lot of women in the room today who feel a particular connection to you through our former Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, mm -hmm. with whom you published a book last year, Women in Leadership. Uh, and next month, you'll open the first World Trade Congress on gender, uh, which the WTO is hosting. Again, can I prompt you to share with us the connection that you see between trade policy and the support of gender equity? And in particular, how optimistic are you about achieving a lot of change in that area from where you stand at the top of the WTO? Well, thank you. You know, people say the first woman and the first African to be Director General in the 75 years of the GATT and the WTO, and I'm quite proud of that. But, um, you know, I love being the first woman and the first African. But really, that's not the point. When I was doing the interview, I said this organization has many challenges. What you need is the best person who can really manage these challenges. And if that person is African and a woman, why not? But that's not the primary criteria. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy it's a woman, it's an mm -hmm. African, and hopefully I'm the best person for the job. <laughs> <laughs> I think given what we were able to do at MC13, we're on our way, mm. but uh, not by, we, we still have a long way to go. But one of the concerns I had coming into the WTO, twofold, internally in the Secretariat, I found we don't have a gender policy. And that, to me, was a bit horrifying, uh, because every big organization, like, they should have one. So internally, we've been working on crafting mm. our gender policy, and actually, Nicole, who is here, is not only my special assistant, she's also my gender advisor, right in my office. <laughs> yeah, so that shows you how much I care about it. The other thing is the women in trade part. Um, and, and how do we mm. enhance uh, the position of where trade is to enhance living standards, mm. to help create employment. And we found that those who trade <coughs> Small and medium enterprises who trade externally, who export, earn twice as much as those who trade nationally. So how do we help women to become these traders, to break into national, regional, and global supply chains? That's really a passion mm. that I have. And so we, we've been looking at different ways. That's why we're having this gender hub. Mm. Uh, we've been doing quite a bit on the supply side. A lot of problems faced by women on supply side issues, access to finance, access to markets, access to the knowledge. And we have an offshoot inter international trade center that is doing an excellent job working in developing countries with women, trying to enhance their, the quality of their products to give them the knowledge, help them with the knowledge they need to break into markets, uh, facilitate access to finance and so on. So that's going on. We just need to scale that up to a larger level. But how about women in terms of our trade agreements and trade policies? We have over 353 regional trade agreements that have been notified to the WTO. And we found 101 of them have a provision on gender, mostly related to empowering women. But not many multilateral agreements have. Actually, we, we got our first one the Services Domestic Regulation Agreement, uh, which Australia, uh, Ambassador Mina is there, was instrumental in bringing to a closure, which has a provision trying to make sure that women are treated mm. equally uh, within the context of this agreement. So we are trying to look at how do we, in terms of our agreements, make sure that provisions that uh, make sure women receive equal treatment, their position is enhanced, they're able to get access, how do we ensure we get those provisions in? That's one. But 
practically also on the supply side, how do we work with women to ease those constraints? That, so we're attacking it from two mm -hmm. angles, and I'm very determined. We see digital trade as a key instrument because we've seen during the pandemic, many women were able to carry on with their business, their small enterprises through digital trade. So how do we make the rules that underpin that? Because we don't have mm. rules yet. So these are some of the areas mm. we're exploring. Mm. Great. Just one general question, Dr. Ngozi, before we break for lunch. Uh, Australia has a long association with the WTO as a founding member, and in fact also of its predecessor, the GATT, from 1947. And your message about trade enhancing living standards is something which I think Australians have taken to heart for a very long time. People are kind enough to sometimes say that we punch above our weight when it comes to supporting a rules-based trading system, because as a medium power with a lot of export potential and a lot of commodity exports, uh, we have a lot to gain from that. So a question to you, Dr. Ngozi, and it's a self-interested one from my countrymen here assembled. What can Australia do to enhance the trade agenda within the WTO? Things seem to have come unstuck to some extent over recent years. Your leadership is a breath of fresh air. There's a lot of support for you and for the agenda. What can we do to really rev up the trade agenda when it's so important, not just for us, but for all of the world and the problems of the global commons, as you've described it. Well, thank you very much. I have to say Australia has already been doing a lot. Mm -hmm. And so it's a question of how do you continue and enhance. Australia is extremely active at the WTO. It's the leader of the Keynes Group. So it's fighting for us to revitalize the agricultural trade negotiations, which are stuck. So there, directly, uh, I hope that Australia can continue to play a positive role to try and help us rethink how to approach these negotiations, which have been stuck for so long. We've got huge issues. Agricultural trade distorting agricultural subsidies have reached about $817 billion as we speak and could reach a trillion by 2030 if we don't do something about it. So this is part of the negotiations that we have to uh, look at. Issues of market access, issues of public stock holding. How do we ensure and enhance food security mm. in future using these negotiations? So I, would, I want Australia to play an active role. And in doing that, I'm going to be asking the Prime Minister. Mm. You say you're a middle power, and that has its pluses and minuses. But I think now there are a lot of pluses. Mm. And uh, you have your good friends with the United States. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, using that middle power ship and your belonging to so many uh, uh, security and other arrangements mm. to push the U.S. to also be more active on some of the issues. Dispute settlement. Our dispute settlement system has been hobbled. It's not completely moribund. We have seven cases ongoing now at the panel level that have been brought this year and 20 actually ongoing. But we need to reform it. So being, I want Australia to help with WTO reform mm. at the working level, but also at the top level. So a, pres a, a message to President Biden uh, that he, he needs to, to really show, have the US show more leadership on this issue mm. would be very helpful. And I think mm. Australia can help us do mm. that. So um, finally, Australia is leading is one of the co-conveners of our e-commerce negotiations. Mm. Digital trade, as I said, does not have rules underpinning it. And 87 WTO members are presently working on a plurilateral agreement that has gone very far to put down the digit rules for, for digital trade. So Australia's leadership on this will also be very, very important. Mm. And then finally, I'm really, really bent on having trade be inclusive. So what we do for micro, medium, and small enterprises and women in trade, uh, um, Australia needs to be active in leading those agreements mm. and on issues of the environment. Mm. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> a lot for us to do. Yeah, a lot for you to do. You're already doing, so I don't feel too strange asking. And mm. you know, you're doing a lot, but I'm like Oliver mm. Twist. I always ask for more. Good on you. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Twist. 
Well, on Oliver Twist note, we might have some more. Yeah. But uh, let's break now for lunch, uh, friends. And then after that, about one or just afterwards, uh, we'll return and I'll welcome your questions from the floor at that point. So uh, please be thinking about what question you might like to put to Dr. Ngozi after we've had something to eat. May I say Thank one you. thing? You may indeed. Yeah, I, I, I don't just want questions. I also want advice. Hmm. So if you have advice about what we should do better and how we should do it, that would be very welcome. I know there are many distinguished people in this room who have had years of experience on these issues, and I truly value hearing from you. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Indeed. Now, as I said before, we'll, um, I'll take some questions from the floor. What I'd like you to do is to just raise your hand so that I can see you and invite you to speak. Then if you wouldn't mind briefly introducing yourself and putting your question to Dr. Ngozi, we'll try to get through as many as we can in the 25 or so minutes that we have. But to kick things off, I'm first going to go to my colleague, Professor Gary Sampson, uh, who many in the audience will know was a director of the WTO in various positions over a lengthy period of time and has the distinction of being the most senior Australian ever to have occupied an office of the WTO. Gary, please ask your question. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Dr. Ngozi, you're remarkably brave to ask the audience to offer you advice. <laughs> <laughs> it's I something, need it. yeah, something I simply answer. can't <laughs> say no to. When can we move the WTO away from being a consensus-driven organisation? When can we see the day when we have plurilateral agreements, open-ended, which countries can join at will? I think this would change the negotiating scene considerably. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gary, and thanks for your service to the WTO. Um, I think the day is now. It's here, but with a slight nuance. I don't think we move away from consensus, but we introduce multiple approaches to negotiations. This is quite controversial at the WTO because there are certain members like India and South Africa with some other developing countries who believe that any other approach that is not a multilateral one undermines the single undertaking. I'm not of that view and I'm quite vocal about it. I think that given the need for the WTO to modernize and to catch up with 21st century challenges, we've got to entertain several instruments and approaches. And certainly the plurilateral, where like-minded countries can come together, or like-minded members, to negotiate an agreement uh, is a good one, provided it also leaves it open, as you said, Gary, on an F MFM basis so that those who are ready can come in, you know, when they are ready. So whilst we maintain the single undertaking, we can also have the plurilaterals and other approaches to think about. So the time is now. Hmm. Another question from the floor. Patrick, thank you. Patrick Durkin. Hi, Dr. Patrick Durkin from the Australian Financial Review, the business newspaper here in Australia. Thank you so much for your address. Um, just more a question from me than advice. I think it would, would be better, but um, to, just to reflect on Australia and China, the relationship there. Um, obviously, we've read that there's been a slight thawing of the relationship at G20, perhaps. Um, I just, and then at the same time, you have the uh, the dispute system, which you mentioned, which perhaps is in need of reform, but that Australia has a claim in there against China. I just wonder if you could reflect on um, what you think, would, if a decision is expected there soon and, and what might come from that, and, and I guess your, your broader reflections on um, the trade relationship between Australia and China at the moment. Mm. Thanks, Patrick. Well, th thank you um, for that. And I think that one of the challenges we are really facing in the world now, which we live on a daily basis at the WTO, are these geopolitical tensions. Uh, we live them daily between the US and China, China and the US, Australia and China, EU and the US. Mm. It's not always, it's sometimes among friendly countries as well. Russia and Ukraine, obviously, and we have to manage them. But on the specific issue you asked about, because these are 
a co the couple of these are live cases before the WTO's dispute settlement system, the one at the panel level. I can't really comment on it. And I always apologize to people. I'm not known to shy away from difficult questions. But legally, I cannot comment on it. What I can tell you is that, um, first of all, I'm really delighted that the Prime Minister Albanese was able to talk to President Xi mm -hmm. because that uh, opens the way. I know Australians were maybe expecting to come away with huge breakthroughs, but that's not quite the way it happens with China sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think you'll need you know, other conversations, but the fact they had it and it was positive and constructive is huge because it opens the door for interactions at the next level of ministers and more technical. So I think that's a good sign all around. I think the second good sign is that at the WTO, the Australia and China have agreed, since we don't have the appellate body functioning, uh, to an arbitration system. Uh, the interim arbitration, there's an interim arbitration system that has been set up by the EU and several other countries, including Australia, China, and so on, to use that as a means, you know, if they have a ruling and they want to, there's an appeal, of, they will go to arbitration using this other means. The fact that the two countries could agree that they would do this is significant. So it shows me that some positive signs, I don't want to overstate the case, but mm -hmm. we're hoping that members will get together in a sensible way and will be able to work things out. Mm. Yes, thank you. Another question? Craig Emerson. I'd just like to revisit the single undertaking idea with you, and that is that the Doha round, the single undertaking is nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, and the Doha round was, we could miss the anniversary, it launched more than 20 years ago. And I, when I was trade minister, I had countries saying nothing's agreed till everything is agreed. Everything will never be agreed, so nothing will ever be agreed. And so, uh, hence the plurilaterals. I'm just wondering if you've thought of whether we should not persist with ambitious rounds such as, such as the Doha round. Most people probably don't even know it exists and just go like the fishery subsidy issue, just go issue by issue rather than having really big ambitious um, vista, if you like, of possibilities and then have countries saying we can't agree anything until it's all agreed, namely the single undertaking. Do, should we do away with um, new rounds of multilateral trade negotiations and just do it on a subject by a subject basis? Well, uh, th th that's really a huge question. Of course, from a former trade minister, <laughs> you wouldn't <laughs> be surprised. Um, you know, I, on the Doha round, I don't dare say every, things are dead on the Doha round because there are many developing countries uh, who really feel quite strongly. And I think the breakdown in trust was due to the non-completion of the Doha round, which was the development round where developing countries felt that their issues were now going to be looked at, the special and differential treatment and all the things they wanted would be uh, taken into account and, you know, we didn't get there. But so parking that for a moment and the issues in the development round, I would say that from what I've seen at the WTO, and I'm being very pragmatic here, the idea of the, the, these rounds, I think is a very challenging one. There's such a lack of trust among members that the idea that nothing is agreed, that we'll have these big rounds, is to me not one that is really workable in these modern times. And given the way that the world is moving very fast, we have a changing technological landscape. We have challenging global commons issues that are moving rapidly. We cannot depend on these rounds anymore. So I think we need to move to these single issue kind of approaches, tackling the ones we can see and getting agreements on them. That is a very practical and common sense approach, in my view, uh, how to proceed with trade negotiations. 
Uh, there was a question at the back, and I'll come to you, Catherine, after that. Yes, this gentleman here. Uh, I'm a, oh, sorry, Chris Nixon. I'm a, just a livestock producer from East Gippsland. Uh, nothing terrifies me more than how cli uh, the climate debate and how cattle emissions are being accounted for. Why don't why doesn't the WTO look at whole of life cycle of carbon emissions rather than certain sections? For instance, it's livestock. We look at methane emissions, but you know methane comes from something that they eat called grass. And that's never accounted for. So, so can we get a whole of life cycle emissions program if, if it's going to get up? Thank you. Well, that's a very interesting question, and I don't think you should be terrified at all. Um, I'm not quite sure that uh, the WTO is the right venue to look at life cycle in, in that way. We are certainly the venue to think about how to price those emissions. Um, but you make an important point. And I'm just wondering to myself, you know, how do we, we, we talked at an earlier, uh, earlier meeting about standard, you know, how to account for these things, carbon emissions, how to standardize approaches to accounting for them. Uh, so this is kind of where this lies and I don't know whether this is something that sort of a United Nations organization like the UNEP and so on should take into into account when they're looking at these issues um, for example so it's a, a good point I'm just trying to see within the context of the WTO are we the right venue to do this but it's something I'll definitely raise with my colleagues particularly with the UN Secretary General um, and in the context of the Paris Accords. How does this, where, and where does this sit? Mm. Great. Dr. Catherine de Fontenay from the Productivity Commission. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering how the WTO is tackling the challenge of more indirect forms of assistance for specific industries. So. Many countries are looking at the possibility of fuel subsidies at the moment. Um, <clears throat> preferential financing for state-owned enterprises or other uh, implicit government guarantees of support for credit ratings. So there's these very indirect forms of subsidy that are, that are challenging for the WTO.
Son. Thank you uh, very much. It's been fascinating listening to um, the issues that you're grappling with and you bring a breath of fresh air. I agree with Ian on that. One suggestion to avoid the regression to subsidisation or barriers, you say that you advocated at COP27 for a carbon price, bringing it back to a market mechanism. You've got a business audience here. What engagement are you having, and I would urge you, if not enough, to get the business community to be accepting of the need for a price on carbon as the driver for change and resist calling it a tax? Because it's the tax what, that kills governments, and it did one I was in, but uh, <laughs> so I speak from a lot of experience. The second point, in relation to your focus going forward about key areas that you try to get more than plurilateral consistency within the WTO. The big challenge everyone is facing at the moment is skill shortages. It's a function of the, of the pandemic, it's a function also of whole range of geopolitics, but what is the WTO doing to facilitate this? Because the skills challenge is not just holding back economic growth, it's the means that enables peace people to go forward. Developing countries need the assistance, but they need it in country, rather than just relying on the export into other countries to give the service. So could I ask you to comment about that one too, please? Thank you. Two excellent questions. I'm being challenged by trade ministers. You know. <laughs> We've had a few. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the issue of the carbon pricing and getting business views in, you're spot on. And uh, I'm actually happy to tell you that in Sharm El Sheikh, we had a session on carbon pricing, and uh, we call it a carbon pricing framework uh, because we realize that not every member is going to put prices. The US, for instance, prefers to use regulation. But if we put up a framework against which you can measure and quantify your regulations, which can be done. Uh, I think I was speaking to Janet Yellen about this, and this is also uh, uh, you know, an acceptable thing. So we actually had a session that was uh, convened by the International Business Council, the ICC. John Denton, who is also Australian, he is brilliant, by the way, and he put together this session so we could talk with business. So I'm very much in touch with him. I think that the business voice, after all, we said the fragmentation of systems is challenging for business and for developing countries, poor countries. So we need to get their voice in. And we, we've started that dialogue and having them input into this and be part of it. I think it's very important for business and important for our developing and poor countries who are very suspicious. On the issue of skills, you know, this is a very important point. We haven't really, you know, be started to get into it at the WTO per se, um, but the shortage of skills everywhere in every country is becoming quite noticeable, including here in Australia. Um, and uh, one during the pandemic, actually, um, when we were during MC12, sorry, when we were trying to negotiate the declaration on the pandemic about how countries would reduce export restrictions and prohibitions on medical goods and so on, India raised very much this issue of skills and the movement of labor um, and wanted to include in the agreement. Uh, some provision or clause for free movement during times of emergencies. But this was not met with receptivity by many developed countries. And uh, they were particularly keen on movement of medical yes. personnel during times of crisis. Um, and of course, you know that, uh, you know, their labor unions or whatever, um, how do you call them? They're, they're, Doctors and nurses in most countries and medical personnel tend to have very strong requirements and 
as a trade associations. You know, I, I can tell you, I have a family of doctors. My husband is a surgeon and three of my four children are physicians. So you see what they have to go through and it's all very tight. So I could see a kind of edginess on the parts of these countries. What are their trade associations going to say? But ultimately, I believe we'll have to look at this in terms of services provision. And we have to overcome these hurdles at some point. Because why is it that as economists, we talk about the free flow of capital and goods, but when it comes to free flow of labor, we always get stuck because there are cultural issues that prevent us. So we have to look at it. Dr. Ngozi, you've been very generous with your time and answering our questions. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to have someone who's prepared to be so open and engaging on such a wide range of issues. So again, uh, I, I just really do feel the WTO is in wonderful hands and it's, it's an organisation that we rely on tremendously and want to wish every success thank in what you. you're seeking to do. So thank you very much again. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now, well, yes. <laughs> my opportunity to invite Karan to close the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karan. Okay. And really, I mean, today's all of us. The whole of us. I think it's fair to say there's no one in the left in any doubt that there is the best person <laughs> on this job uh, right now. As he ever remarked, um, hard to miss your eloquence, your candor, and your humility is truly 21st century leader. I certainly am filled with confidence for your ambitious agenda of re-globalisation, as you say, led by the WTO. So it's been a real privilege for all of us. We hope that it won't be too long before you come back to Australia and to Melbourne. And we do, of course, wish you every success uh, in opening the first World Trade Conference on gender next month. It remains only for me to thank the very many people involved in making today's event possible, starting with the busy teams at DPAT and the Secretariat of the WTO. It's been wonderful to meet many of our colleagues from those organisations here today. I need also to thank the teams from across the school um, who helped to make this possible and so enjoyable for all of us. And in particular, I'd like to thank our colleague, Professor Gary Sampson, uh, for playing a very important role in making this happen for us. Thank you, Gary. So now, um, I'm going to officially close the formalities, uh, and I would ask you to remain seated uh, while our former party makes its way out. Hopefully, oh, the out there for just a couple of seconds. <laughs> I hope for it to stay in too long, but if you wouldn't mind remaining seated, and then of course do feel free to stay on at least till 1.30, and you're very welcome to stay on beyond that, I'll we'll just ask you to move to the hunt for that conversation. But thank you again, and lastly, just put your hands together for Dr. Newell.